do you want to say anything about how you take your medication and the reasoning why that might help somebody else? Yeah, so they gave me this, um, I'll put a little picture of it here, but they gave me this device where I could put my pills and they would last the week. And I think it would even, I forget how many weeks, but they'll put it here. But, and then I could just take my pills like at, you know, a.m., noon, evening, and p.m. Or bedtime was kind of the times. But uh, for me, what I found was, I just had this thought that, to me, it was just more natural to take and open each bottle and look at it and feel it. Like I had everything memorized, you know, so, you know, it took me a while. I would double read it, you know, I was slow um, for the pills, but I would just take them on my own because I was afraid that I could see that happening. And maybe not, maybe somebody else would want to go a different route. But for me, I was afraid I would load the pill box, take the pills, you know, and then you kind of have to look, you know, you don't really learn how you're taking them, you know, what you're taking, because you're just opening the little pill container and taking them. But I was afraid that I might get a pattern where I'm actually loading it incorrectly. I think that's how my, that's my brain, you know, um, do what works for you. But um, every time we go, we go in every week, have lab work. Every time we go in, they ask me what medications I'm taking and I know exactly what I'm taking. I know exactly what they look like. I have a couple that are exactly the same looking, you know, the magnesium and the acycle are look the same, but they break apart in the mouth different when you take them. So, you know, I, I have everything different. Like my liquid medication, I don't need to know the name. It's, it's, the, it's the only liquid that I have. I know the first couple letters, that's all I need to know. But um, yeah, I just, that's how we did it. Michelle made a little list. She, you know, it was tacrolimus in the morning, AM meds, breakfast, uh, walk, brush teeth. Uh, when I started doing the dumbbells, dumbbells, um, different things like that. And I would check it off and it would made it really nice. And uh, that was very helpful. And then we kind of stopped doing that for a little while. And I pretty much knew what I was doing and remember, but every once in a while, I can't remember, did I take my tacrolimus? Or, you know, and you don't want to double up on that one. You know, oh, I can't remember, did I take my PM meds? So um, that's where a caregiver can be very helpful in putting together a checklist for you. Because um, when you first get out of the hospital, you're not really in, a, well, you might be, but I wasn't in a place where I could sit down and had the bandwidth to, to put together a schedule. We were also talking a little while about, you know, what can a caregiver do for you? You know, what, what would be pointers for a caregiver? And every relationship is different, but when I was first diagnosed, Michelle got a good cry and she was in denial. <laughs> you know, I was kind of numb to everything and just kind of went with the flow. Just, I can't believe this is happening. This is surreal. But at the same time, I was holding on to God, you know, these two different feelings. I can't believe this is happening. Why, why me? <laughs> and, um, you know, just hanging on to God. Well, you know, and by the way, don't ever walk away from God. What you still are gonna have your illness you still whatever your problem is if you walk away from God you still have it you know so you might as well just hold God's hand and walk through it and believe God um, but pointers I think one of the big things is is communication like with anything it's communication you know um, we were open I think the caregiver has to realize that they need a break they can't do it all and um I think the other thing is the caregiver and the good thing about being in a, a marriage relationship is um, I'm still itching. I've grabbed versus holes I'm itching all over and um, a caregiver. I lost my train of thought. Communication. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially after the transplant because your motivation level is gonna be not just your energy and how you feel, but your motivation, your desire to do things that affects your brain, it affected my brain, I should say, it might not affect yours. But um, 
to know, to get those little pushes. Um, like, no, I'm not going to do your laundry. You know, you can do your own laundry because you're doing light movements. You're getting some, I mean, I could, when I got out of the transplant, you know, I didn't do my um, exercises like they wanted me in the hospital to do. And I mean, to cut me some slack, it was, I mean, I didn't have, I, I could barely stay awake in the chair. You know, I'd, I wouldn't sit like this. I would be like, yeah. you know, sleeping and half, but I could barely lift my hands up in the air, you know, my arms, you know, I'd use the mouse on a computer and after about 20 seconds, it was all sore because it's not being used, those muscles. But I think just getting those little pushes, um, you know, um, like if we go out on the deck, Michelle cooks a meal or something, I'll help put away stuff down. Um, I cook my own breakfast, you know, so this all kind of gradually happens. You know, at first Michelle did everything for me. And, um, but I think just having that little push and knowing what, what to do. I think the other thing too is, I think you have to take, um, I guess what I'm saying is you have to take a leadership role. Um, and that can be kind of, <laughs> you know, in a sense you have to step up because your, your spouse can't, can't do it, but just whether it's helping lead a devotion or it's, um, I think encouraging you, like if you get, who needs to step up? Um, the caregiver. Yeah, the caregiver needs to, because, uh, well, it depends too, you know, it depends on your role, who does what, you know, in a relationship. But there's a lot of things that I used to do in our relationship that I stopped doing. So Michelle's had to kind of do those things. Like Michelle, I always took care of the outside lawn, you know, the yard work. And we have a lot of perennials and a lot of things out there. And I would do a lot of, a lot of it. She would help it. I would do the heavy bulk of, of the stuff, you know? And, and so now she has to do that in addition to all her other things she already does, you know, and she's working. Um, and the other thing is that I don't know the financially what you can do, but Michelle cut back her hours because she couldn't, she couldn't do it. So Michelle's working three days a week instead of four or four and a half. And um, by the way, tip, um, you should be applying for um, social security disability uh, right away because it takes you six, you have to be disabled six months to get it. But that's something that you're gonna wanna do right away because especially if you have AML, depending on what type of leukemia, you know, you'll, you'll probably get it. Um, but, uh, oh, it's another one, babe. I guess we just, this is just kind of uh, off the cuff because I don't feel good. We don't hug as much, you know, just giving a hug. You might have to initiate that. We don't touch like we used to, you know, I'm talking about just we're made to need, we need love and, uh, you know, you have to work on just keeping, just giving a hug, <laughs> stay positive, um, believe God, and uh, have a great day. <laughs> Bye.